Okay, so the next talk by Morteza de Rakti um, from uh, APL, you dub. Okay, please. That's right. Thank you. All right. Uh, so, hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for the, uh, the comedy to give me the opportunity to present the, the work. So today, I would like to talk to you about the uh, some recent work and observations and modeling of uh, wave breaking dissipation and bubble plumes. And this is the work I've done over the last two years. Um, uh, it's uh, supported by NSF, and I would like to thank uh, um, uh, my collaborators, uh, Jim Thompson, the APL, leading the, uh, the observation part, and also Jim Carey at the University of Delaware. Oops. So um, as you know, the, the breaking waves uh, dissipate excess wave energy flux, and they transfer the wave energy into turbulence currents, generate bubbles and spray, and they uh, play a major role in a number of uh, air sea interaction processes, uh, the mass, uh, heat, momentum, energy fluxes between the ocean and atmosphere. And um, so a lot of different application, also optical properties and acoustical properties of the water column. But uh, here we mainly interested in the uh, quantifying and uh, understanding the dissipation and the bubble plumes. So, uh, uh, the turbulent dissipation rate uh, usually and the associated mixing of that uh, usually characterized by uh, the turbulent dissipation rate, uh, epsilon. And uh, so in the upper ocean, there are many different processes that generate turbulence and contribute to this. Um, so breaking waves are one of them. Uh, so, uh, but the level of energy, uh, the energy dissipation by breaking waves are much higher. So. We have sort of background, we call everything else uh, other than breaking epsilon zero, the background turbulence level, and uh, above that, it's uh, uh, the contribution from breaking waves. So uh, we know uh, from numerical uh, simulation and observation that this dissipation is very concentrated near the, uh, the free surface, mainly in crest region. So if you want to observe it, you have to be in the wave following frame of reference. And uh, if you uh, average over some uh, spatial area and depth integrated is a good proxy for wave dissipation. Um, and for bubble plumes, um, um, usually it's characterized by the surface uh, area, the, the white cap coverage of visible white caps. And also if uh, you need to have the, um, the plume depth and uh, some properties of the plume to uh, quantify um, hopefully link it to the dissipation. And intuitively, um, you know, we, we know that these two should be um, related. You know, they're usually co-located um, based on a number of previous uh, uh, numerical simulations. So um, here in this context, uh, uh, the high fidelity observation and modeling are referred to uh, uh, those that can provide estimates of these parameters, the dissipation rate, the, the bubble, bubble plume dupe and depth, uh, the white cap coverage, things like that in a uh, wave phase resolve sense. So there are uh, many observations previously uh, by uh, Thompson et al. Um, that they put the, the uh, drifting buoys and observed the dissipation using structure function. And, uh, but uh, from previous observation, we, we observed some challenging and uh, some problem, uh, you know, some um, challenges in the previous observation that motivate this study. And uh, so we, we joined together uh, and uh, the, the main goal is to combine the, the modeling uh, and the observation to improve uh, uh, the observations of the, uh, the dissipation. And hopefully we, uh, in a new data set, we, we also measure the bubble plumes. And so we can look at the uh, relationship between these two so the, for modeling, uh, it's an LES model. Uh, it's a, a, a much higher resolution. Uh, it's turbulence resolving, but uh, LES. So you can um, have the numerical tanks on the order of what you can do at uh, typical lab flumes or basins. But the main challenge is the, the matching the model and field condition. Uh, so <clears throat> I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit uh, more. So before going through the result, I would like to uh, uh, make it clear that the, the, the breaking waves in the deep water 
So this is uh, the movie uh, it took uh, from one of the storm days during the cruise. Um, it's very different from shallow water waves. So they're uh, 3D short crested, uh, uh, very highly unsteady and intermittent in space and time. And you have wide range of scales. So, uh, and um, so as you see this, if you, you know, you have big breaking here, a lot of small breakers and um, <clears throat> um, it's really, um, a really wide range of scales. So, and uh, if you look at the active uh, uh, breaking crest, uh, it's only occurring a small fraction of the ocean surface. Even in storms, you know, you have like a fractional area of 1% or, uh, you know, something about that. So it's a small um, uh, area with active breaking crest. And here uh, you see a drifting buoy here. And we would like to sample these events. Uh, uh, so uh, it's, it's sort of a random walk through these intermittent events, different direction, different scales. And uh, a lot of time you, you, uh, you don't have a chance to be at the breaking um, uh, region, right? So it, definitely you have a sparse sampling of these events. So uh, one of the, uh, the first question was, um, uh, and um, if you look at the instantaneous picture, you know, uh, usually the useful representation of these variables in terms of the average values, right? For example, if you look at the wave average sense, uh, you would like to have, uh, uh, when you talk about the dissipation, you would like to have the average value of dissipation over like 10 wavelength by 10 wavelength on the, the ocean surface, right? So it's a few kilometers, few minutes uh, and average. But what you can get from, um, these uh, drifting buoys, you know, it's, it's kind of a random walk, as I said, through these events. So the question is, uh, the, the statistics you get from these uh, data, how they compare to the Eulerian sort of the, the you know, the spatial average. Uh, um, uh, and uh, uh, we basically use the model uh, to study that. Um, so uh, the model description validation, you know, I have a lot of stuff I have to go through these really fast. So it's been described in a number of papers. Um, so just want to talk about the main assumptions. Um, so it's not DNS. So it's um, uh, it's an uh, LES approach. And um, but we include bubbles and subgrid bubbles. And if you look at the Stokes number of these bubbles, you know, for typical uh, breaking waves. Uh, so the Stokes number is usually less than one. So you might use a Larian approach. So and what we've done, uh, we use polydispersed bubble phase. So we have a number of different sizes, but we don't resolve individual uh, bubbles, right? So we need the bubble entrainment at the surface. So we connect the, the volume of entrainment to the local turbulence property at the surface grid. Uh, so we can resolve the breakup at the very beginning, for example, the breakup bubbles. So we put the bubbles, you know, we use the the size distribution um, look uh, um, mentioned and also Dean and Stokes. So we use that initial size distribution and put these bubbles in the model and then they interact with the fluid turbulence and we count for uh, the, the momentum transfer between the two phases. And also we have some bubble enhanced dissipation, which is mainly because of the wakes uh, that if you have the different velocity between bubble of uh, surrounding fluid, you can generate these wakes and these wakes enhance the subgrid scale um, turbulence. Uh, okay, so um, the validation, so basically we look at the uh, most of the available data um, at the lavish scales, um, meld the group, a lot of uh, unique data sets, we use those. And we look at the breaking induced turbulence and currents the, and dissipation rate. And in general, uh, we showed very good um, uh, comparison and uh, when we uh, do LES with uh, the, the subgrid scale bubbles, we, we see the improvements of the numerical results. So, and in terms of the total dissipation, uh, we, we get uh, within five to 10% of the observed value. So uh, these are just some uh, examples. Uh, we, we also look at the, the integral properties of the bubble plume, you know, the normalized air, the total uh, volume of air, you know, the area of plumes, centroid of plumes, and also the, the, the average void fraction. So for example, here, that's a model and data. So uh, fairly um, good comparison. And also for shallow, uh, shallow water breaking waves, uh, 
did the same thing with the data set from uh, Kirby et al. and uh, Blankenstein Chaplin. Okay, so let's back to uh, our problem, the sparse sampling. So uh, we design a, a, a setup to sort of mimic what we see uh, um, in the field. So for example, here is a breaking wave, it's a short crested breaking wave and we have a swift uh, drifter and we sample the data with this. So we designed, uh, we used the short uh, crested focus packets in the numerical domain, it's in deep water, a number of cases. And if you look at the wave spectra in the field, you would say, uh, you have some swell um, and some uh, equilibrium range. So what we've done is uh, with this uh, uh, boundary condition, we sort of, we can reproduce the F to the minus four, uh, the slope of waves in the equilibrium range. So, but definitely we don't have any swell motion in the domain, the numerical tank. And then we put some virtual drifters. And um, so we have a sequence of breaking waves in the tank. Uh, you know, at different locations, uh, each packet break at different locations and with different scales. So it's sort of uh, uh, idealized kind of condition uh, compared to the field. Um, and then uh, we sample the data with these virtual drifters, okay? So as I said, one of the challenges is how you uh, connect what you see in your, your numerical uh, tank with the field observation. We don't have wind in the tank. So, you know, these waves are uh, mechanically generated at the wave maker. So there are a lot of differences. And, um, but, uh, you know, uh, I've, I've done this for, for years. Uh, so uh, we found that, uh, you know, maybe the best way to compare uh, is scale the amount of breaking in your computational domain to match the active white cap coverage uh, you, you see in the field. So, uh, you know, using some, uh, some thresholding for the bubbles, um, you know, you can calculate the, the, the active, uh, the fractional area of active breaking in your numerical domain, and then, uh, you know, compare it with the, the value of WA, the active white cap coverage in the field. Okay, so this is the way, so, you know, we found, especially for more complicated cases, you know, steepness or, uh, you know, these uh, uh, other measures not uh, representative. And then, uh, so instead of having few drifters, uh, you know, or, you know, go through a long distance in a long time, you put a lot of virtual drifters in the numerical domain. So if you, uh, you know, choose a randomly a number of these and you know, uh, make a signal, you would approximate this random walk of a real drifter in the field. Okay, and then you know, we have number of uh, more than ten or fifteen breaking events. You know hit these virtual drifters and, you know, they, they uh, place randomly. Um, and then we can look at the convergence of statistics. And so specifically we look at the, uh, the comparison, uh, the, the error between the true Larian uh, dissipation rate uh, from the model, because we have the spatial variation. So we can calculate the Eulerian average. And then we, um, randomly choose between these virtual drifters and then average them over. And with different length of these uh, randomly picked uh, virtual drifters, uh, you would get an average. So the error, if you look at the, uh, the variation of the error with the length of um, uh, virtual drifters, uh, you would say, uh, you know, you can get reliable averages after 1000 to 3000 waves. And um, uh, for example, here, uh, you also see that uh, when you have smaller uh, breaking events, so uh, smaller WA, the white cap coverage, you would get more sampling, right? So it's it's harder to uh, get this, uh, stable um, uh, statistics. So in terms of the the ocean waves, you would get you you have to have one to three hour of the data to you know get your um, average dissipation rate, and this this actually uh, explains uh, you know. Uh, some of the uh, scatter in the previous study, but uh, so because usually these uh, dots re refer to 10 minutes average or eight minutes average. And, you know, definitely we found that it's not enough. So you have to average or a longer time or multiple uh, drifter uh, to get more stable. So it's just uh, some of these are just because of the intermittency of uh, uh, this problem. The other question, uh, one of the main motivation for the project was um, 
this figure from Thompson et al. 2016. So uh, what they observed, uh, the, they, they say uh, um, they found uh, some bias in the observed value of dissipation uh, x-axis. Uh, so you have the depth average, long-term integrated dissipation rate. Um, so it's a source, uh, uh, it's a sink, and then the source is a wind input rate, right? And then uh, for um, equilibrium uh, sea states, uh, you would expect a one-to-one -one relation, right? So they, they found some, uh, uh, they found that they can observe enough dissipation for, you know, high values of uh, input rates. So, and it's, it's not uh, because of the formulation for estimating this wind input. So it's sort of a robust um, uh, uh, thing. And um, so the question is uh, uh, probably, you know, when you have this kind of, uh, the bubble field, you, you can see through when we use uh, ADCPs, you know, the sonar system to estimate the dissipation rate. So when you have dense plumes and uh, intuitively, those are the regions that high value of dissipation occur. So you can sample those data sets. So it's, um, we, we, uh, from the model, we look at that. So from the model, we have dissipation rates and also the bubble void fraction. So this plot shows um, the distribution of these, um, and then uh, you know at probably at uh, void fraction one percent or something around that, the occlusion occur. So probably you don't have this part in your data uh, because of bubble occlusion. And then from the model, where we can actually uh, quantify that. So we we have the total dissipation, and we can ignore uh, the data. In those region, and so we we end up with some correction factor, uh, which uh, um, um, we pr uh, parameterize it based on the active uh, white cap coverage, and also the the uh, depth range. So if you don't have enough uh, uh, vertical profile of uh, the observation, you also can uh, you know, going to be bias low. So this uh, so we uh, empirically we from the idealized numerical simulation, we got this. And then when we applied that to uh, the field, uh, uh, the, the data, uh, we actually got a much uh, better result in terms of the connection between the wind input rate and the uh, dissipation rate. So uh, these are the corrected, the diamonds corrected data as a data times the correction factor. And this is the original one that we saw the discrepancy. So we think, uh, Using this correction factor, it's you know, very empirical, uh, but um, apparently improved the observations. So in conclusion from the, mod uh, the modeling part, uh, we found that uh, we can get statistically stable averages of dissipation rate using these uh, uh, drifting uh, 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 buoys, but we need uh, long enough uh, data to, do, uh, this, to obtain the statistics. Uh, and uh, we found the correction factor, uh, be, which accounts for bubble occlusion and depth ranges. And this is published in um, JPO 2020. So um, the, the next part of uh, the talk, uh, I think I already passed 20 minutes, but sorry. Uh, so I'm going to be uh, fast. So I'm very excited. This is unpublished. So it's uh, the late uh, 2019, uh, beginning of 2020. So it's a three weeks of uh, cruise from Dutch Harbor to Seattle. Um, and uh, we use two types of buoys um, in this uh, cruise. Um, so we can measure dissipation rate over three meter in wave falling frame of reference, up looking and down uh, looking ADCPs. And uh, you know, the unique uh, uh, feature of this data set is we also have the, the, the bubble plume uh, uh, information uh, that uh, provided with echograms over 30 meter depths with uh, one centimeter vertical resolution sampling rate of one hertz. So we, um, we were lucky to observe a, a wide range of sea state conditions, especially, you know, we, 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 we've been in a, uh, uh, one storm, one major storm, sustained uh, uh, wind speeds of more than 20 meters per second. And, you know, um, uh, the wave height more than 10 meters, uh, HS more than 10 meter. So, uh, and also, you know, calm days, rainy days, you know, different set of CC conditions. So I'm gonna talk about more, uh, don't have 
uh, time just about the, the new feature of this data set. It's about the, the bubble plumes using echograms. So, um, so this is the, uh, the return signal, you know, um, the sonar system, the sonar uh, from the ADCPs as a function of time and over 30 meter depth, right? Um, so, uh, you know, we look at the days without a visible breaking, very calm days. And so we got some background um, levels and with uh, some thresholding, we can detect uh, the bubbles pretty robustly. And this is, uh, so at this time, uh, this is the picture, you know, sh uh, shows the, the overall uh, picture of the, the, the sea state. At this time, you know, we've got a huge breaking waves. And, uh, you know, these buoys, we, we put some GoPro uh, cameras. Uh, so we have also um, uh, subsurface images. So I've uh, so this was the first time we got this uh, kind of data, and uh, you know we, uh, we try to look at the, what we get from echograms and compare them with optical images, and um, we sort of found that um, uh, we we might detect two uh, stage of stages of the the bubble plumes with the different threshold, you know uh, the the first threshold uh, like um, we we might get. Uh, you know, the, the bubbles uh, with not uh, very high concentrated regions like this, uh, C or D. So still you detect it as a bubble plume, but the concentration are uh, not very much based, you know, very uh, qualitatively. But, uh, you know, when you, when you have more uh, return, you know, stronger return, if you look at the uh, subsurface uh, images, you know, you, you would get some uh, saturated uh, bubble plumes. So uh, we try to, uh, look at the the average uh, uh, of penetration depth at these stages, and also from this data we can look at the residence time or decay time of these uh, plumes. Okay, uh, so you know I've been through um, uh, you know a lot of uh, different uh, um, days, different condition, and sort of we found that uh, the first threshold we found uh, from the, the the echograms. You might get the uh, you might get the uh, bubble plumes at stages you know the, the active breaking probably between A and D or E so the first uh, the uh, and then uh, uh, the other uh, threshold um, you could uh, get uh, you know the stages with uh, less dense uh, plumes so um, for capital T which uh, uh, the stage of the plume with uh, big and small bubbles, uh, we, we got this. So you have uh, a nice correlation with the wind speed and um, the residence time uh, could be, uh, you know, a few minutes for storm condition. And for uh, the, the stages with saturated bubbles, uh, we found, um, uh, again, a good correlation with wind speed, but smaller time, uh, which uh, in terms of, uh, the the peak uh, uh, period it's it's like between one and two uh, peak period and you know when you look at the data sometimes you have like um, you know 30 seconds residence time and this is average over many events so and we uh, you know we've uh, identified some events that even after 30 seconds after breaking um, you know you have a really dense saturated uh, uh, plumes uh, and so it's we think uh, it's reasonably uh, uh, consistent with what you see from optical subsurface images. So from uh, the penetration depth, uh, um, we found this nice correlation with uh, wind speed again. And um, sorry, I'm going fast. Uh, um, so this is the, uh, the, the average penetration depth of bubbles with the stages with saturated bubbles, which probably you would use to estimate the volume of uh, plumes. Uh, so as, uh, this uh, penetration depth correlation with the white cap coverage. So, uh, and also the active white cap coverage. And if you multiply these two, you, you can estimate the volume. And then one of the, uh, the big question of this project was how uh, the total dissipation, which you see some correction factor, as we said, uh, how this relate to the volume of uh, bubble plumes. And um, 
you know, we got some nice uh, relationship there. They're really correlated and um, well, we found some uh, good uh, uh, relation. It's, it's not a linear relation, but uh, uh, still have some scatter. And um, uh, so, um, uh, so first of all, uh, this uh, justified the studies that uh, like uh, that try to estimate the white cap coverage from the dissipation rate of white wasa. So they're really, uh, uh, we, we found the, I, I guess, uh, one of the first field evidence of this. So uh, this project, uh, this result support this. And uh, for, we still see some uh, variation and uh, some scatter. And we, from the data, we found uh, the rain effects might be important. And, um, and also wind acceleration, uh, especially in low wind, uh, you know, uh, low wind condition, the, the, the wind acceleration is a key parameter. So um, uh, hopefully we can uh, look uh, more on the effect of these uh, and the, the white cap coverage, you know, the plumes and the, uh, the total dissipation. And at the, the end, I would like to thank all the, uh, the, the crew members and, uh, you know, all the people that made uh, this data available. Thank you so much uh, for you, for your attention and happy to take questions if I have time. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Marquesa. Uh, very interesting.